Hello, hello. Welcome, everybody. So today I'm going to be talking about a book that I read from Ken Wilber. Um, a little bit late. This was published in 2000, and it's called Integral Psychology. It's the first time I've been exposed to this. I got recommended it by someone. Um, the subtitle is Consciousness, Spirit, Psychology, and Therapy. And I want to sort of go through this book and talk about what it's trying to gesture towards. It's sort of a complicated textbook. It's written like a textbook, as if you were to take a class and have to study it. So it was pretty interesting because of the subject matter, but it was a little dry because it was written almost academic in, in its approach. Um, so I would only recommend this book if you are really interested in the topics um, like I am um, or if you're a, a pretty like voracious reader. Um, I wouldn't recommend this to sort of the average, you know, picking up a book, not sure if you're going to read it or not. Uh, you probably will not finish it. But let's get into the point of this book. What is the author trying to say? The author is trying to say that in terms of psychology, spirituality, all the work that's been done over the past centuries in all different independent places, we should take the common elements from every spiritual practice or tradition and try to merge them together and learn and integrate them um, so that we can apply the learnings from everywhere into a consolidated uh, version of spirituality. He goes through a couple different approaches, and I like the scientific rigorousness from Ken Wilber. He talks about basic levels and how it's not a timeline of going from one state of consciousness into like over time a more complicated version that's not how history has has occurred um that's sort of a western mindset of you know linear uh progression of time and it's not quite going from a lower state into an upper state a lower consciousness like that of like a cockroach or something into like a fully formed human being that is one with the universe it's not quite a straight line up and down Instead, he views it as a circle kind of spiraling from a lower state of being, spiraling up into a higher state of being. Um, he defines, we'll go through the, the table of contents now. He defines this idea as basic levels or waves. He calls them de de developmental lines or streams. He talks about what the self is, and I recently listened to a podcast where Sam Harris was talking about how the self is an illusion, and I, of course, I'm not going to say I'm smarter than Sam Harris, but I'm going to say I disagree with that. Um, I think there's something to a self, and, you know, it's almost like, it could be like an asymptote, where the closer you approach, you may never get there, but you can sort of gesture towards what a self is because, um, you know, I'm, I'm making this video, I'm speaking, there's something in me that's, there's my body, there's my mind, there's my consciousness, and all these things are mysterious, but there's something driving it forward, causing me to say these things. I've had these thoughts, I, I'm going to make the video, I'm going to set up, I'm going to read the book, I'm going to talk about it. And so maybe the self, me, Michael, speaking to you is an illusion, but there's something there. And so this book tends to gesture towards things and try to um, capture them with language, capture them with his writing, capture them with charts. And he's not saying that the self actually exists, but he's saying whatever it is, this is what we are pointing towards and we're sort of boxing it in and as it is different than like there's a conception of multiple infinities in different directions okay so one of those is 
I. There's, if, if I were to speak to you about myself and my experiences, there's an, a, a limitless potential in, in all of that. Same thing when I'm having a dialogue and I'm speaking to you. There is, whoever the you is, there's unlimited potentiality in the you. Then there's outside of you and me, it's the world. And that doesn't seem to be unlimited. It actually seems to be limited, but it's meaning the physical world, the world of things, the world of matter. Although it's limited, it's inconceivable that a self, that a singular person can experience the entire world. So in a way, it's unlimited. Um, and then there's sort of society and, and kind of them. It's you, me, the world, and then society's impact on the world. And those are sort of the four quadrants that uh, go out to potentially infinity. Um, and that's what Ken Wilber is trying to integrate all of those modes of being together. Um, he also talks about the Eastern approach versus the Western approach. And if you want to check out a couple videos that I have um, with Carl Jung, uh, I've read his essays um, and it's worth seeing. There's one essay in particular, uh, The Spiritual Problem of Modern Man, and then uh, East versus West Thinking. Um, so in the spiritual um, you know, development, uh, in the Eastern tradition, there's you know, meditation, it's achievable by all. In sort of the Western tradition, there's very much a church aspect to it. Um, there's kind of, uh, you know, Christianity, Catholicism sort of dominates the Western spiritual tradition. Um, but there are other um, religions. But it's sort of in that framework, and it's sort of scientific in its approach. Um, you know, you have the Enlightenment, you have rationalism, you have things trying to box it in. Um, you know, there is some overlap, like, for example, the Quakers in the early United States uh, sort of had something that seems to be like a meditative practice. They would have, um, you know, they believed God was was there in the silence. So they would have, um, they would go to church and they would stand there for hours and not say a word, trying to sort of feel the influence of God. Um, and then God itself is... You know, when I'm saying this in a video, you probably have some conception of what the word God means. Um, if you ask five different Christians what the what their what God means to them, you get five different answers. Um, in the Eastern tradition, they don't have God. You know, I'm talking about I'm talking about Hinduism, Buddhism, um, Jainism, and theirs is more of a spiritual meditative practice. Um, and they, they believe in a divinity of the self and that you as a human being have something within you that's God-like, um, and, and everybody has that within them and they can achieve that state. Um, so the attempt of Wilbur's work is to integrate the two together. Let's go through the first here um you have matter and physics in the middle then you have life mind and then sort of the soul and then spirit which is causal interesting that we start with matter in the middle and biology goes outside of that and then psychology is the study of the mind and right there we could pause and say you have to integrate your psychological tendencies why humans behave the way they do, why they think the way they do. And you have to sort of integrate that with your biology. And this is something that Wilbur mentions that um, a, a form of, of uh, consciousness development that's akin to like a centaur. So a centaur is a, a mythical creature that has the body of a, of a horse and sort of from the torso up, it's a man. And so you have the the brain connecting with the body and he calls that centaur centaur and that's integrating your psychology with your biology and that's very interesting because i i do work on myself with this i i try to get my physical body to do what i want and i realize there's limitations but in my mind there are no limitations the only limitations are 
I can't think of, you know, five things at the exact same time. I, I have to focus on one thing, but then I can move systematically um, through time if I'm concentrating on something. Um, and then a limit, another a further limitation is that sometimes I lose attention or I'll get distracted by things and I don't have infinite amount of time um, to, to think about these things. But I can integrate that into my body by making that mind-body connection. Um, when you go to the gym and work out, in a way, you're pushing your physical you know, ability to get to the next set or to increase more weights. And that's a physical thing. But it's also a mental exercise. And that's why, for me, going to the gym, it's almost a byproduct is that I get you know, uh, physical benefits from it. I feel healthier. I feel better. I, I look better. All that's great, but to me, the most important is the is the mental um, knowing that I can push through and and you know uh, the only reason I go to the gym so much is because not because I like it or anything. Um, Joe Rogan uh, has this this phrase: "What if you could take a pill to feel this way? Everyone would take that pill." So exercise, if it was like a drug, you would take that drug every day. So I almost view it like, oh, it doesn't matter if I want to or not. It's that I can. It's good for my mind, good for my body, and then of course there's many other benefits. Um, I've I, I've had many days where I don't like to go to the gym at first, but I've never had a day where I go to the gym and then afterwards I'm, I regret it. Okay, moving on. From psychology, you then get into theology, and then from theology you go into the outer ring, which is mysticism, um, and then beyond that is sort of the spiritual non-dual. This is really interesting because from psychology we can how, how do you get from psychology to jump to theology in my mind it's study of attention and i know that human beings psychologically can think themselves into depression and think themselves into anxiety states think themselves into like a, a fight or flight or freeze response and so i i know I know uh, from Jordan Peterson, you know, kind of the hell to avoid. And psychologically, that helped me in my life. And it sort of jumped me from a psychological well-being state to a theological state. Um, it got me thinking about what could be. And so the way I made that jump is I, at, at one point in my life, and I've talked about this in other videos, I was pretty depressed. And I thought, this sucks, sort of nihilistic, life is terrible. And I sort of realized that as bad as it was, it could get worse. I, you know, I, I had enough food to eat. I had uh, friends and family, not many friends at that point. I, I had trouble sort of making friends and realizing the significance of having friendships to help me. It's not because, you know, I'm sort of an introvert. I don't want to hang out with people all the time. And, but if I take that to an extreme, then I end up alone. And then if I'm not feeling well, you don't have a, a good group of people to help you. Um, and, you know, you always got family, but if I'm not picking up the phone or sending them texts back, then family tends to leave you alone. So even though you have family, they're not around, you're not getting the benefits from it. So I, I understood at that point there was a hell state, um, really bad. And so psychologically, I had to make the jump. And in order to make the jump, you have to get weird. You have to get spiritual. You have to get... Um, outside of yourself because you can't solve a problem like depression on your own. You can't work yourself out of it. Um, you can, and this is what I figured out, talk to a therapist. You could talk to a, a clinical you know, psychologist, a, a trained professional. You can uh, exercise. You can fix your diet. You can regulate your sleep, and that actually gets you pretty close to it. Then you go out and talk to people, and you can socialize. And with all these factors, and maybe with uh, medication, I was on Wellbutrin for a couple years, um, which is an antidepressant. So with all those together, I couldn't point to a singular thing that got me out of depression, but it was a combination of all of those. It helped me realize that, you know, jumping into theology, that there is something greater, and it's sort of a spirit, an essence, um, a soul. You have to be, you know... It, the health of the body, the health of the mind, there is that spiritual aspect of it. And, you know, at times I've thought, you know, been agnostic for sure. Um, I'm not sure if I ever consider myself an atheist at any point in my life. Um, 
maybe I did when I was 18, 19 and reading uh, God is Not Great or The God Delusion or Waking Up. You know, I went through, that's kind of the, you know, mid-2000s, late 2000s uh, atheists, um, you know, books that were that were popular at the time. Um, but I, I would say I always was developing those ideas and I don't consider myself to be an atheist now. Um, I don't really want to talk about details of that because that's not really the point of this video, but I do believe that there is something underneath all of us, underneath what we can, you know, our senses. Um, I think there's a spirit of some sort and that's where the theology gets into. And then j jumping beyond that, the mysticism, this is where I like, I, I sort of realized a couple, you know, years ago, months ago, uh, pretty recently though, if you give me like an hour, hour and a half doing an activity, I can almost get into a mystical state reliably every time. What do I mean by this? I mean, really hard exercise, um, concentration on a task, a movie, um, a workout, um, like going on my Peloton, I, I do hour long classes. Why? I mean, I don't want to do it for an hour, but something happens about 35, 40 minutes in where this becomes a mystical experience. Um, you can have this with, with psychedelics. Um, you know, if you're taking, uh, acid, uh, it's kind of an eight to 12 hour long experience by hour four or five, when you're sort of in that peak state, that's when the mysticism starts. So I'm sort of familiar with the mystical state of it, and that kind of gets in the spiritual causal. Um, and so integrating all these levels together is is the point of this book. Let's move on to the next. Let's see, chapter two. There are some graphs where he talks about the cognitive, moral, interpersonal, spiritual, and affective um, and where that goes into body, mind, soul, and spirit. Um, I like this next sort of circular ring um, graph, figure three, the integral psych graph as a holarchy. And I want to remind myself what a holarchy is so I can tell you guys what it is. Give me a second. To introduce a useful term... These basic levels are holons of consciousness. A holon, H-O-L-O-N, is a whole that is part of other wholes. For example, a whole atom is part of a whole molecule. A whole molecule is part of a whole cell. A whole cell is part of a whole organism, and so on. As we will see throughout this volume, the universe is fundamentally composed of holons, holes that are parts of other wholes. S moving, uh, skipping ahead a little bit. Since each holon is embraced in a larger holon, holons themselves exist in nested hierarchies or holarchies, such as atoms to molecules to cells to organisms to ecosystems. The great nest, is what he calls it in capital letters, is simply a big picture of those levels of increasing wholeness, exactly as indicated in figure one. In short, the basic levels are the basic holons, stages, waves, spheres, nests, in the great nest of being. So you can see with the holarchy, the inner ring is the body, mind, soul, spirit, and how you achieve those states outside of the, the body into the mind is sort of through cognitive processes, moral applications, interpersonal relationships, spiritual development and affective states. Um, I couldn't tell you what an affective state is as I sit here, but um, sure I could look it up, but let's move on. Then we get to chapter three, which is the self. It's a pretty short chapter and kind of the conclusion. I'll read the first few sentences. What each of us calls an I, the proximate self, it is both a constant function and a de developmental stream. That is, the self has several functional invariates that constitute its central activity. It is the locus of identity, will, metabolism, navigation, defenses, and integration, to name the more important. 
and this self with its functions also undergoes its own development through the basic waves in the great nest. Especially significant is the fact that, as the locus of integration, the self is responsible for balancing and integrating all of the levels, lines, and states in the individual. In short, the self as navigator is a juggling act of all of the elements that it will encounter on its extraordinary journey from subconscious to self-conscious to superconsciousness, a journey we will soon follow in detail. Wilbur talks about uh, different colors being associated with different states. Uh, talks about beige being kind of the base level, sort of when you're a, a small child, you sort of uh, learn the things in beige, which are archaic and instinctual. The level of basic survival, food, water, warmth, sex, and safety have priority, habits and instincts. Uh, beyond that is purple then red, then blue, then orange, then green, then yellow, then turquoise, uh, becoming kind of one with the universe. After beige, it's purple. Purple is magical, animistic thinking. Um, this is where you believe in sort of magical spirits, good and bad, uh, curses, spells, determined events, ethnic tribes. The spirits exist in ancestors and bond the tribe. Um, kinship and lineage establish political links uh it sounds holistic but it's actually atomistic so those are his ideas they believe in voodoo like curses blood oaths uh, ancient grudges good luck charms etc uh he says estimates it's about 10 percent of the world population about one percent of the power um next is red red is that of power gods the first emergence of a self-distinct from the tribe. This is powerful, impulsive, egocentric, heroic. Uh, dragons, beasts, powerful people, feudal lords protecting underlings. The basis of feudal empires. Uh, this is seen in the terrible twos, rebellious youth, frontier mentalities, feudal kingdoms, epic heroes, James Bond villains, Attila the Hun, wild rock stars. Uh, sort of 20% of the adult population, and it kind of consists of five percent of the power next is blue so for blue this is conformist rule uh blue thinking sort of you get to a state where you think life has meaning it has direction it has purpose outcomes are determined by an all-powerful other or order itself uh kind of believe in ab absolutist principles of right and wrong Violating this code or rules has severe, perhaps everlasting, repercussions. Uh, this is the basis of ancient nations. This is seen in, in Puritan America, Confucianism, Confucianist China, England during the Dickens era. Uh, codes of chivalry and honor, Islamic fundamentalism, boy and girl scouts, patriotism. Sort of 40% of the adult population thinks this way. 30% of the power is located there. Next is orange. Orange is scientific achievement. Um, it says that this way the self escapes from the herd mentality of blue. It seeks truth and meaning in individualistic terms. Uh, this is the basis, basis of corporate states. Um, Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged is an example. The Enlightenment. Wall Street emerging middle classes around the world, cosmetics, trophy hunting, colonialism, the Cold War, etc., fashion industry. 30% of the adult population believes in this orange way. 50% uh, of the power seen here. Next is going to be green. Green is the sensitive self. Communitarian, human bonding, ecological sensitivity, networking. The human spirit must be freed from greed, dogma, and divisiveness. Divisiveness. This is seen in postmodernism, Netherlands idealism, Rogerian counseling, Canadian healthcare, human humanistic humanistic psychology, uh, Greenpeace, animal rights, ecofeminism, postcolonialism, Foucault and Derrida, and ten percent of the population thinks in this uh, green way. Fifteen percent of the human power. Next is yellow. Yellow thinking is integrative. Life is a kaleidoscope of natural hierarchies, 
holarchies, systems, and forms. Um, you have to be flexible, spontaneous, functionality, have the highest priority. Um, good governance facilitates the emergence of entities throughout through the levels of increasing complexity. So this is sort of a nested hierarchy. The next and final uh, way of thinking is turquoise. Turquoise is holistic. Universal holistic system, holon slash waves of integrative energies, unites feeling with knowledge, centaur, multiple levels interwoven into one conscious system. This is universal order, but in a living, conscious fashion, not based on external rules, blue, or group bonds, green. A grand unification is possible in theory. So turquoise thinking uses the entire, entire spiral. It sees multiple levels of interaction, detects harmonics, the mystical forces, and the pervasive flow states that permeate any organization. This second tier thinking is 1% of the adult population, 5% of the power. In part two of Integral Psychology, Wilbur describes the path from pre-modern thinking into modern ways of thinking. And there was one section in this part where he discusses what is modernity and how is that different from pre-modern thinking. And um, it was really interesting because he gets into this chart called the four quadrants. The upper left is interior individual. This is sort of intentional. It goes from what people on an individual level, the, the individual experiences inside your own mind, your own experience. Uh, the upper right-hand corner is the exterior for the individual. This is sort of behavioral. Um, this is how the person interacts in with the exterior. So it's I thinking versus it thinking. It does this. I do this to it. The lower left quadrant is the we quadrant. Um, interior collective. This is cultural. So you start with sort of understanding kind of vegetative, locomotive, um, archaic, magic, mythic, rational, centauric. It's what should culture be doing? What should all of us in this tribe strive towards? What, how should we change? Then the lower right quadrant is social. It's going to be its. Um, this talks about galaxies, planets, Gaia system, uh, groups, families, tribes, early state, empire, nations, planetary, agrarian, industrial, informational. What should the social people what what should all of us be doing uh he goes on later to talk that um specifically in terms of communism where communism got it wrong is they only focused on the social so the lower right quadrant and they don't take into account kind of what democracy sort of aims for which is the i what do i think about this issue i will go and vote on it or um a representative democracy um, this representative, this is the governor of our state. He represents uh, what we're doing. This is we. Uh, we state identity follow the governor and what the governor says, or we disagree with it. And instead, what communism sort of falls apart is it only fo focuses on the social. What should other people be doing? So it's kind of uh, you have you know Joseph Stalin, which elects himself to be a leader, and then he determines that he's going to be um, a representative of of the entire culture of, of of social dynamics what the the country should be doing and that just it just falls apart because you're not taking into account what other people individually think and want then to integrate pre-modern and modern approaches there was sort of the great nest with the four quadrants this is intentional subjective it behavioral objective cultural intersubjective and then uh, social, interobjective. Really interesting way of thinking about this. You know, I would have never, we kind of know all these things in the abstract, but putting them on the page, putting them in these really helpful charts and graphs helps me understand what the author was trying to say and apply it to the real world because these are just frameworks and how we can look. Um, 
the author goes into more details and I just can't communicate that through a video, but these charts do a pretty good job of it. Um, interesting in the conclusion talks about a, a platonic idea of what is the good. And this is sort of, I, I loved it because it's, I, I'm writing about this in, in my fourth blog post. that's going to be released here soon. Um, pre Christianity, uh, that has its virtues of, you know, love and brotherhood and, and doing unto others as you would have for yourself, which is sort of the Western framework of what makes a good person. Um, it's not all Christianity based, but that's where we get a lot of derive a lot of our values. Um, instead, you know, before that 375 years before Christ, Plato talked about what the good is, talked about the beautiful subjective truth, uh, the true sort of objective truth. And then the good, which is intersubjective truth. So it's not just an op my opinion on what is beautiful. That's a subjective truth. It's getting the group to agree to it and agreeing that that's the good. And then sort of taking the objective. Well, regardless of what I think, regardless of what you think, that is the truth, whatever that is. And then we can see what's good between you and me to go towards the beautiful. I really like that breakdown. Um because that is how we um, should approach culture, life, everything, integrate it all together. Talks about how there are correlations of interior conscious states with exterior material states. So sort of interior, you have your own viewpoint of the mind, body, soul, and spirit, and then you have the outside world. And so that graph on the right side um, it's sort of dot, 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 but then the left side, there's, um, a way of thinking about it. And that's the pre-modern approach. They had the world of matter, and then they started to think about these things from an internal state. I read, uh, like, it's like a two minute clip on the channel where I, I read two paragraphs from the book, but I just sort of want to repeat them here. Um, Wilbur talks about how the ancients sort of conceived of what their body was into what the mind was and then extended that into what the soul was. And so you should go watch that clip. Goes into further detail on the four quadrants. Talks about, you know, developmental streams that just exist in the modern uh, viewpoint going from agrarian societies, hunter-gatherers into civilizations. Um, talks about motivation, levels of food, uh, the levels of need, drive, fundamental motivation. I've, I've always been interested in psychology of motivation. What causes people to pursue the things that they do? Because that affects behavior. Um, you know, worldviews talks about how sharing more worldviews. This is all parts of the kind of the ancient generation of these into the modern sense where we're sort of sharing all these things together. Talks about affect, gender, aesthetics, art, different types of cognitive lines. Talks about spirituality and stages. This was sort of interesting because there's sort of four common, five common definitions. So the first is spirituality involves the highest levels of any of the developmental lines. Two, Spirituality is the sum total of the highest levels of the developmental lines. Or three, spirituality is itself a separate developmental line. Four, spirituality is an attitude, such as openness or love, that you can have at whatever stage you are at. Or five, spirituality basically involves peak experiences, not stages. So which of those five do you think that... Um, you can measure spirituality. Some people are just straight at number three. It's or straight at number four. It's an attitude. It's just a feeling. You know, if I think about love, I'm just at my highest spiritual uh, attainment. Um, personally, I, I don't think that's the case. I think there's some sort of um, all of humanity has a developmental line towards spirituality. And I think these are my thoughts. I think an individual being born has a trajectory that they can go up and they can reach those peak states. Um, and I think some people are stuck at like zero. They, they, they'll never actually spiritually progress. And, you know, I think those people end up having tough relationships, tough times. But I think a person that has, 
I do believe this, that there are um, kind of the Buddha, Jesus, certain authors, maybe Gandhi, um, a couple, you know, probably spiritual teachers and gurus uh, that I've just heard about, that they've achieved such a high level individual spiritual awakeness, uh, being in touch with the souls of others with the, the the spirit, the source, God, whatever you want to say. And they've achieved a state that's higher than like the highest that they're going to go. And so I think there, that's sort of like a peak experience, but extended out overall such that if people go and just talk to people like that, they just get up. It, it moves their own developmental path on their spiritual stage. So I, that's, those are my personal beliefs. I don't know where that fits in. Wilbur goes on to talk about sociocultural evolution, um, talks about, you know, why is it the case that, you know, is, is it a fact that we go from pre-modern humans into a modernized version? And then where do we go from here into, to postmodern? um, discusses the dialectic of progress, talks about how consciousness evolves and unfolds each stage solves or diffuses certain problems of the previous stage and it adds new and recalcitrant and sometimes more complex and more difficult problems of its own so he does believe in some sort of evolution where we're not just you know cyclical going back and forth he believes there's a stream um connecting where we used to be into an unknown future state um he mentions the distinction between differentiation and dissociation. Something can go wrong at each stage. The greater the depth of the cosmos, with a capital K, the more diseases there can be. Human evolution is marked by a series of important differentiations, which are absolutely normal and altogether crucial for the evolution and integration of consciousness. It is only by differentiation that an acorn grows into an oak. He talks about the difference between transcendence and repression, that certain parts of our human experience as, as a globe, we're going to transcend in certain areas, but we're also going to repress certain things. And so Carl Jung talks about this, where you have to go, you know, so he would do it through psychotherapy. He would, you know, Freud did this as well. He'd do a dream analysis and try to get from the subconscious, the things that the individual is regressing uh, or repress, or sorry, repressing um, and sort of bring those out and then to help us transcend and move forward. So that's on an individual level, but um, Wilbur's here talking about in the context of sociocultural evolution. Talks about the difference between natural hierarchy and pathological hierarchy. That's complicated. Um... Normal and natural hierarchies can degenerate into pathological hier hierarchies, into dominator hierarchies. Uh, the, another thing he talks about, the fifth one, is higher structures can be hijacked by lower impulses. So tribalism, when left to its own devices, is relatively benign, simply because its means and its technologies are relatively harmless. Um, this is kind of talking about sort of the movie the social network and so even though this was written in 2000 before widespread use of social media um the new tech industry uh, has you know facebook tiktok instagram um all social media platforms twitter higher structures can be hijacked by lower impulses um they're trying to get to you know get people to be reactive and that causes many other people to sort of be guided and by their emotions as opposed to um, other areas to integrate. Wilbur goes on to talk about how modernity goes into postmodernity. And what's interesting here in these final few pages is he talks about so going from the pre-modern is sort of going to each one of those four quadrants and applying them to self and to others and sort of extending those out. And those were the great philosophical thinkers um, brought us to those areas. But the jump from modern to postmodern thinking is to integrate all four of these quadrants at the same time and to 
transcend them in a spiral upwards, integrate everything we know, and go along all four in at the same time, all four quadrants. Um, kind of progress our our understanding of the of the colors mentioned before in the video. Um, the colors referring to types of thinking, um, integrate all those types of thinking at the same time. Um, talks about the bright promise. And the bright promise is to be inclusive of all these things, holistic and embracing in its best sense. There's good news. The good news, the heart of postmodernism. Moments of truth in postmodernism. Oh, here's a good description of postmodernism. Incoherent as the postmodern theories often sound and often are, nonetheless, most postmodern approaches share three important core assumptions. One, reality is not in all ways pre-given, but in some significant ways is a construction, an interpretation. This view is often called constructivism. The belief that reality is simply given and not partly, not also partly constructed is referred to as the myth of the given. Two, meaning is context dependent and contexts are boundless. This is often called contextualism. Three, cognition must therefore unduly privilege no single perspective. And this is called integral a perspectivism. Wilbur says, I believe all three of these postmodern assumptions are quite accurate and need to be honored and incorporated in any integral view. So I know Jordan Peterson sort of says the postmodernists kind of, it's almost like a co curse word at this point, but uh, Wilbur talks about how that's just inevitable. We're going to have to integrate our modern thinking into a mo post modern approach um, in order to progress um, the dialectic forward and, and progress culture forward. And it's also good for an, for an individual to do so um, and to be a part of a group of like-minded people. Meaning is context dependent, goes on, all of that, talks about more of the things. So that's sort of the good news. The bad news is uh, through this postmodern approach, language collapses. The I and the we domains uh, and reduced all of them to nothing but interwoven its as in a dynamical approach of network processes. So in the postmodern viewpoint, you can fall into the problem of if I say I, then I'm not speaking about anyone. If I say you or we, I'm not speaking about anyone. Everything turns into an it's um, sort of out there, non-existent, non-contextual, can't actually um, hold it, feel it. It's non-tangible. So, you know, all the, all the language gets gets um, sort of loses its, its usefulness and meaning. Uh, another flaw with the postmodern approach is depth takes a vacation so it denies that there's any depth in anything if there is if language the, the words we're using don't actually mean anything we can't get further than that surface level understanding or just below the surface um if i can speak in a way that really makes sense to you now we can have a dialogue back and forth and we can discover things very deeply about each other and sort of use that bring it back, integrate it, and then move onward and upward. Then he gets into the conclusion. And then we do the one, two, three of consciousness studies. Talks about the mind broad, body problem. Mentions qualia, which uh, if you're interested in that, you should read the book Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Um, first, I was introduced to the concept of quality, qualia, which is that, you know, the taste of coffee, the taste of chocolate, the experience that you're having. Um, it's hard to define, but um, this sort of using the study of the qualia of people's experiences and integrate that because we all want to have a, a good experience. And then sort of leaves it to there. So I think that's a pretty good overview. I hope that you've... Um, sort of gotten a better understanding of Wilbur's work, um, at least my interpretation of it. 
Um, if you've read his book, if you have any comments, please share them below. Um, and let me know if you enjoyed it or not. All right, that concludes this book review of Integral Psychology. I hope you've enjoyed. Please leave your comments below. Me, Thanks for watching up until this point in the video. And uh, give me a like, give me a subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. Also, read my blog. All right, bye.